So before we start, is anyone here from Cape Town? <laughs> okay, no. Are you guys kidding with me? Or? <laughs> wow, okay. Um, so, um, I'm a software developer. Um, I work for a company called uh, Energy Partners in Cape Town. Um, I'm a software developer, like I said, I'm not an electronic engineer, so um, just with that disclaimer out of the way, we can, uh, we can move along. So, the Raspberry Pi is a credit card sized computer, um, a single board. It was developed by the Raspberry Pi Foundation with the aim of uh, promoting computer science in schools. It runs Linux as an operating system, and luckily for us, um, Python is the recommended language to use. Um, Thanks to the GPIO, or General Purpose Input Output Pins connectors, uh, we can interface with a range of electronic devices um, from existing circuits to buttons to switches to motors to anything we can dream up. Um, this model pictured here is actually the Model B Plus, which was uh, recently uh, released. It's an update for the Model B. It now supports four USB ports. It has an Ethernet uh, network port a 3.5 mil jack for stereo audio and composite video. It's got an HDMI port so you can connect it directly to your TV or this giant projector if you, if you wanted to. Um, and it's got a 5 volt micro USB port so you can power it with any capable cell phone charger. Uh, and then finally, um, you can see, oops, sorry. It's got the GPIO pins. In the case of the B+, it's got 40 pins. So it's got considerably more GPIO pins available than the um, previous model B and A. Um, just a comparison between the different models. Um, model A is the cheapy at $25. It's only got one USB port. Uh, it's got no Ethernet and a standard SD card slot. The model B is a slightly more advanced. At $35, you get two USB ports. It's got network um, and normal SD card slot as well. I think it's got double the RAM of the model A as well. So I think it's got 512 megs of RAM. And then finally, the model B plus. Um, it's basically replacing the old Model B. It's got four USB ports, also a network. It now uses a micro SD card slot. Um, and also it's got the 40 pins, so it's got more GPIO slots. So general purpose input output pins are basically, a, uh, it's an interface to the physical world, world between, between the Pi. Um, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have any built-in protection on the GPIO pins. So if we actually create a short, if we, if we short something out, we can actually damage our Pi. Um, but luckily for us, it's, it's quite simple to build a simple input-output circuit, um, which can not only protect the Pi, but also offer us a lot of flexibility connecting to other electronic devices. Okay, so we'll move on to the hardware. Um, sorry, I meant to say earlier, my talk will be divided into three parts. Uh, first, I'll cover um, the hardware itself, so building the input-output circuits. Then I'll move on to introducing it to the RPI.GPIO uh, Python module, so we can actually control the output pins and input pins from Python itself. And then finally, I'll share with you some of my own projects and hopefully give you some ideas of your own. So the first part of building our input circuit is the, um, the first component is the opto-coupler or opto-isolator. Basically consists of a, a light source, which is usually a LED. Um, and a closed channel and a photo sensor, which basically detects light from the LED and converts it, in, sorry, converts it into an electrical signal. A resistor, one of the most common electronic components, implements electrical resistance and reduces current flow. Before we get to the actual input circuit diagram, an important concept to cover is uh, pull up and pull down resistors. Um, if we've got an input pin on the Pi, and there's nothing connected to it. And we try and read the value of that pin from Python. Uh, anyone want to venture a guess if that value will read as high or low? <laughs> Undefined is pretty close. Um, the value will tend to float. So it can actually be either. So the, most, uh, the best way to put it is to use a, a software analogy. Um, it's simply like initializing a variable to a known state. Um, so pull-up resistors are connected to the high voltage. In the case of the Pi, this is 3.3 volts. And um, if there's no input connected to the input pins, it pulls the value of the input pin to high. Uh, pull-down resistors are connected to ground. So if there's nothing connected to the input pins, it 
um, it will read a low value. Okay, so onto on the actual input circuit diagram. On the left-hand side, we've, we've actually got our input connections which we'll, that we're actually measuring. Um, we've got a, a 1K ohm resistor on the input. This is basically just a current limiting resistor so we don't damage our LED light, which is um, in the optocoupler. Um, when the input is off or not connected to ground, um, obviously the LED will not light up and this part of the circuit will not be switched. Um, if the input is, is closed and connected to ground, the current will flow through the LED, which will, which will basically um, emit light through the channel, which is picked up by the photo sensor, which switches the um, circuit to on. Now you'll remember from the previous slide, I talked about input, uh, sorry, pull up and pull down resistors. Um, in this case, you can see that the pull up resistor is, in, is uh, actually internal to the Pi. Now the Raspberry Pi has internal configurable pull up and pull down resistors which you can actually um, configure in Python itself as well. So in this case, um, if the input is open or off, um, the pull up resistor in this case will, will cause a value of high to be read from the input. And if it's um, connected, then it'll read a low value. Okay, so onto the output um, circuit. The first component we'll talk about is a transistor. Uh, it's got three leads. Um, it's used to amplify or switch uh, signals. Um, if we apply a, sh a, a low amount of current to the base of the transistor, then we c a larger voltage is allowed to flow between the collector and the emitter. A uh, relay is basically an electrically operated switch, um, and we can use a low power signal once again to, to basically switch the relay to, to on. Um, onto our output circuit itself, now a relay can switch a variety of, of voltages, but the Raspberry Pi only outputs 3.3 volts um, and only very few uh, milliamps. I think a max of 50 milliamps across all the output pins before um, you start blowing stuff up. Um, so we can't actually drive a relay directly from our, from our GPIO output pins, which is why we use a transistor in this case. Um, if the GPIO pin Output pin is set to low, then there's no current that is attached to or flows to the base of the transistor, and no no voltage or sorry no currents are allowed to flow um, uh, through the relay. So the relay is actually off. When the GPIO pin is set to high, um, a small amount of current is connects to the base of the transistor, and voltage can flow through the through the relay to ground and basically switches the relay to on. Sorry, I'm messing up my electronic terms quite, a, quite significantly today. <laughs> okay, so now that we've got the input and output circuits um, and we've uh, bought all our components, um, I like to use a thing called Vero board or strip board. Uh, it's similar to breadboard, um, it's just slightly more permanent because you actually solder the connections onto the board. Um, you can basically cut it into uh, smaller sections, um, as large or as small as you want. And you lay out your components onto the, onto the board itself, and then you solder the bottom of the legs onto the, to the board. So you've got a permanent um, installation. Uh, another handy um, thing to have is a 26-pin IDC ribbon cable and a crimp connector. Um, so obviously the, the model A and B has 26 pins. Um, if you've got the model B plus, you're going to need a slightly larger one, probably a 40 pin if, if, if there's something like that available. Um, obviously, this, these connectors are separate and you crimp it onto the actual ribbon cable. Okay, so now that I've taken you through the theory of the actual input and output circuits, um, I'll show you some shortcuts. Um, if you don't feel like building any electronics yourself, you can actually order them straight from eBay. Um, there are some other sites as well, but eBay, uh, if you know what to look for, is um, really cheap. Um, these are some that I bought recently. I haven't actually tested them out, but I'm, I'm sure they, they work pretty well. On the left is an output circuit. It's actually got four relays on it, so you can actually connect four outputs to it. Uh, top right is actually, I think it's a noise level sensor. 
and the one just below that is a photo sensor, so it detects uh, certain light levels. Now, an important thing to note about the Raspberry Pi is it does not support analog inputs. So if you've got a sensor that has a range of outputs, like let's say a thermometer that has various outputs for um, different temperatures, um, you'd have to get a separate um, analog to digital converter for the Pi. Um, you'll notice that these sensors have adjustment screws on them, so you can basically set the value at which it triggers. So if you reach a certain noise level or a certain light level, they'll trigger and it'll basically change the state of the, of the sensor or the input pins. Right, some other accessories you might want to look at. The top picture is actually of the GERD board. Um, this provides um, quite a few functions, including various input and output um, connections which already have protection built in. Um, so it's one thing to look at. Obviously, various cases for the Pi. In this case, you've got a Lego, um, Lego case. And one other essential ingredient is a Wi-Fi dongle. Um, you get some that work out of the box. You just plug it into the Pi. So you can actually mount your Pi in a remote location. You don't need a network connection or a network cable running to it. Okay, onto the software. Um, first, the actual GPIO mappings. Um, the Raspberry Pi, the B version, brought out revision 2 um, in about 2012. It's just got some slight configuration differences in the hardware from revision 1. Um, so you notice the, the, the two diagrams on the left. Um, oops, sorry. You notice there's some slight differences between these. And then obviously on the one on the right is the Raspberry Pi B+. Um, you can see it's got 40 pins, so it's got considerably more GPIO outputs. Um, and if you're not sure which revision you have and you got your Pi in about 2012 and um, you want to find out what, what revision it is, you can just use cat proc CPU info and it'll spit out a number which will tell you actual hardware revision. Um, so some software considerations. Um, the software is actually the easy part after all that hardware. Um, but it is possible to actually damage your Pi just from software alone. Um, so it's necessary to triple check your pin configuration. And to illustrate how, how you can actually damage your Pi just with software, I'll just go back to the input circuit quickly. Um, so imagine in this case that we've got our input connected to ground, so this is on. Um, and now we accidentally configure our input pin as an output pin, and we output a value of high. Uh, what, what's going to happen? <laughs> exactly, it's going to be a short. The, the magic smoke will come out. Um, I don't know if you know about the magic smoke. It, it's what makes all electrical components work. But once it escapes, um, it, it no longer works. There's no, there's no way to get the smoke back in again. OK, so those are the software considerations. Uh, so I introduced you the rpi.gpio module. And depending on your distro, it's probably already installed. I know Raspbian specifically has it installed already. You might just need to upgrade it. If it's not installed, just use pip install. and. Um, installed it. Uh, basic usage, um, import the library, of course, uh, and then set the mode, uh, which is actually the pin numbering scheme. You've got two options here. The first is board numbering, which refers to the actual pin numbering on the actual um, device itself. Uh, so if you have a look at the previous, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. If you look at this again, the actual pin numbers would be these numbers running down the middle here. So if you use board numbering, you're actually referring to those numbers. And if you use BCM, it's actually a slightly lower level of um, referring to them. It actually refers to the channel numbers on the actual chip. So um, the GPIO numbers, that's what it refers to. OK. So before we get to the actual input and output parts of, of um, the library, um, we just have to uh, quickly cover exiting cleanly. Um, and obviously, as I covered before, Outputs can actually damage stuff. So inputs are always safer to have than outputs um, because you can, you can sort something to ground and it can damage your, your Pi. Um, so another important note is this. When the script exits, any ports that you actually configured in your script, um, if you don't reset them, they're going to stay as is. So if you configured an output, bit, sorry, output pin and you're outputting a high value to it, um, if your script exit is still going to continue setting, uh, outputting a high value, um, which is obviously not the safest way to, to, to leave um, the pins configured as. So 
before your script exits, always, always make sure to, to perform a cleanup. And it's very simple, you just call gpio.cleanup. And it's important to just remember that this, if this is on the last line, it's not necessarily going to be where your script exits. So if you have an exception that occurs that, you, that you're not catching, or if you have a keyboard interrupt, um, then it, your script might exit earlier. So you just need to accommodate for that. Um, setting up inputs. Um, basically, configure it as you call the setup method, passing in the channel um, number, depending on what your numbering scheme is that you selected. Uh, you set it as an input pin, and you actually specify the pull up down you specify which pull up or pull down resistor you would like to use. In most cases, it will probably be a pull up resistor. Um, and here's an example of um, passing a pull down resistor. And, and then we've got several options to actually read the input values themselves. The first is just um, simple polling. And we call the input method on the actual channel number we've got configured. And we get this constant back or um, high in case of a high. Um, we can also put this in a loop. Um, but it's going to be processor intensive, so it's not really a recommended way to, to do it. Um, the next method is wait for edge, and it basically blocks execution until the edge is detected. An edge is basically a change in value, so um, if the state of the input pin changes from high to low, then that will be um, an edge. It will be gpio.falling. If it arises from a low value to high, that's rising, and both would actually mean that you actually want both edges um, to be detected. Okay, so the next method is event detected and it's designed to be used in a loop with other things. So I know Neil is giving a talk about Pygame in the other uh, room. So if you've got a Pygame uh, main event loop and you want to also pull the GPI opens, this is the way to do it. It doesn't actually block um, and it's also not going to miss edges. So it's um, safe to use in, in other event loops. Um, and then finally, we've got a, the threaded callbacks. Now, the GPIO library itself runs, runs a second thread just for callbacks. Um, and you add one by calling the add event detect method, passing in the channel which edge you're looking for, and then your own callback method. And that will obviously be called in a, in a separate thread. So outputs are actually significantly simpler than inputs. Um, again, here we set the mode, and then we set up the pin as an output. This is again the, the actual pin number that we, that we want to set up. And then um, outputting values are very simple. Um, to set the output to high, you just call the output method, passing in the channel number and the actual constant. Um, low, same thing, but just passing in the low value. Um, you can also read the value of, or the current state of an output pin by calling the input method. Uh, so if you want to toggle something, you can actually use this method to um, to get the current state and to apply the, the opposite. Okay, so on to an example. Um, uh, in my house, or the current project that I'm busy with, is to take one of these um, IP cameras. Um, uh, what I'm gonna do is actually install it at my uh, front door um, so that when, when someone actually presses my doorbell, uh, obviously the first thing I want to do is to actually hear a sound, so there must be a bell or a buzzer or something that, that sounds. Um, and then the IP camera should take a picture of the person and actually um, send me a notification on my phone. Um, so that's my current goal. Um, to test this and to write the software for it, um, I just bought the simple momentary push button. Um, and I had an LED light strip lying around, which I'm using as a uh, replacement for the, the bell or the buzzer. And I'll show you some code, um, some simplified code. Okay, so. Um, first of all, we're importing our GPIO library, and we're importing the time library as well because we're gonna add a bit of a delay uh, once I press the button. We want the LEDs to light up for a few seconds or the bell to sound for a few seconds. Um, then we configure our input pins. It's just hard-coded in here just to, to simplify the code. Um, we're setting the, the mode to BCM. Now, if you remember, that's the actual channel numbers, so I'm referring to the actual GPIO uh, pin numbers here. Not the actual pin numbers, the GPIO channel numbers. Um, then we enter a while loop which runs indefinitely. So the first thing we do is we set up the bell input pin. So this is for the actual button. 
We set it as an input pin, and we set a pull-up resistor. Um, and now we wait for an edge, and we tell it we want a falling. So with the pull-up resistor, uh, it will measure a high value if there's nothing connected to it. So the, bu the button is not pushed, it, it reads a high value. Um, so the moment this edge is detected, someone has pressed the button, execution continues to the next line. Now we'll set up our light pin as an output pin. Uh, this is the number configured, and we set it up as, a, as an output pin. Um, and then we actually output a high value to the light pin, which will switch the light on. And um, then we just sleep for three seconds. So basically the light's on for three seconds, and then we run GPIO cleanup. Um, it's debatable whether or not this is the correct way to do it. Uh, effectively, what the cleanup now will do is to reset all the pins we've con configured in the script. So it'll not only reset the output, the output pin that we've configured, but also the input pin. Uh, an alternative would be to just take the output pin and uh, if you were really paranoid, just to change it to an input pin, which would obviously be safer. Um, but yeah, it's debatable which approach is, is the best one. Now you'll notice that this entire while loop is actually wrapped in a try except. Um, and this is just to make sure that we also catch um, not only keyboard interrupts, uh, but also any other exception. Um, and then we perform a GPIO cleanup in the finally clause. So it's just to make sure that if um, any uncaught exception happens or the user interrupts the script, that the cleanup still executes. And um, effectively our output pins are reset, or all our pins are basically reset back to the original state. Right, um, my original project that got all of this started was um, the Raspberry Pi alarm. Um, I don't know if you've ever gotten a quote for uh, external IR sensors that they install outside, um, but they're very expensive. They, from about two, 2,000 Rand upwards, um, whereas one of these IP cameras, you can get off eBay for about 500 bucks with shipping and import duties. So I figured why not just get a whole bunch of them and create a whole IP network outdoors and then use the motion detection built into the IP cameras to actually trigger my alarm system somehow. So in order to, to get this working, I needed to do two things. The first, first of which is to actually read the status of the alarm, so whether or not it's armed or not. So obviously if it's, if it's not armed, I don't, want, I don't want the cameras to do anything. I don't even want them to record. Um, and how I achieved this was just to connect an input circuit straight to um, the part of the alarm that actually outputs to the LED. You know, those LEDs that they mount on your garage to tell whether or not your alarm is armed. It actually outputs 12 volt. So it's a perfect place to connect an input circuit um, and tell whether or not the alarm is armed. Um, secondly, I want the, the, act, the system to actually um, set off the alarm. So if motion is detected on the IP camera, um, I want to actually trigger an alarm um, I've got three zones on my alarm. Uh, you can't see it on this picture, but there's some expansion <laughs> boards here. Um, so basically, just an output circuit which is connected to a free zone on the alarm, and if you output a high value to them, then you basically set off the alarm. Um, I also, I actually wanted to access this remotely, so what often happens is we leave home and um, I can't actually remember if I switched the alarm on or not. Um, so I wanted a way to actually be able to remotely, or from the office, um, figure out whether or not I did arm the alarm. Um, so I just created a simple REST-based implementation with Tornado. Um, I don't have time to actually dig into the code, but you can get all of it at this URL. Um, yeah. And then finally, uh, what's next? Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do, especially around the house. Obviously, IP cameras give you a lot of functionality uh, and a lot of power. Um, the Bell project I did mention to you. Um, irrigation computers that you buy in the shops are very expensive and very stupid. I think the most intelligent thing they can actually do is to, to um, switch or override the, the computer if, if it's um, been raining. But there's no way to know, you know if it's going to rain later the afternoon to just simply not switch on the irrigation. So, you know, why not have a moisture level sensor in your, in your soil connected to your Raspberry Pi? Um, and if, it's, if the soil is moist, there's no, there's no way to, I mean, there's no need to actually water it. You're just gonna waste water. Um, and that you can all do with the Raspberry Pi. Or query a, a weather API to, to see if it's gonna rain later in the day. 
Um, why not? I mean, it's so simple to build in that functionality in Python, so um, with the Raspberry Pi, we can actually do it. Um, and then I just put a garage opener here. I mean, there's lots of things you can do with garage openers. You can put a switch on your garage, which actually tells you whether or not the door is closed and open. Um, and they usually work with um, receivers, which are pretty simple to hack into. Um, you just, uh, yeah. Um, actually, they've, they've got uh, ports that you can connect directly to, output a certain um, voltage, and you basically open your garage. So why not write an app on your phone which can open your garage for you? Then you don't need, need to pay your alarm company, um, I don't know how much, to, to come and sync a little um, remote receiver. Um, so yeah, there's, um, there's lots of possibilities. Uh, anything with the electrical current flowing through it um, can be hacked. Um, so really your imagination is your only limitation when it comes to what you can build next. Um, right, so move on to questions. Just before we get to the questions, um, I did include a parts list for um, my 12 volt input circuit, output circuit, plus any extras you might need. So you can actually go straight to Mantic and buy the parts there directly. I know Mantic's got a branch in uh, Joburg as well. And then finally, there's a list of references with the input circuits and output circuits. Um, I'll just um, tweet a link to the um, slides so you can actually download, download it and um, you can use these um, as well. Sorry. <coughs> Any questions? Please be gentle. <laughs> we'll, we'll walk over with a microphone for the questions so we can get them on the camera as well. Well, I must say, the first thing that occurs to me when you talk about getting into your homes remote remotely is a question of can someone else do that and turn the thing off? <laughs> That's a, that's a very good question. Um, obviously, the first, very first thing I looked at when I do this is um, security. Um, <coughs> um, I've only got an input um, running over the REST server at the moment, so um, until the actual security part of it is finished, like, there's no way I'm going to actually allow the manual switching it on remotely until the security is 100% complete. But yeah, security is definitely a, a very important consideration. Anyone else? Um, <coughs> for the watching when a, over here. <laughs> for watching when the state of a GPIO pin changes, yeah. is it possible to use? Um, or is the infrastructure in that library to have to tie in with a select or poll so that you can use another event loop uh, to get a callback when the, cha the state changes? Um, well, there's two different methods that you just mentioned. Um, the one is in the event loop and the other is a callback. So it's two different methods. <coughs> in the sorry, in the event loop, um, sorry, where did I? I'll have to scroll quite far back now. <laughs> Oops, too far back. Sorry, never mind. Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna go back to the method, but there's, a, there's the one method which, which you can use in a poll, which doesn't, it doesn't block the CPU, so it also doesn't miss the edges at all. So it's um, safe to use in a, in a different event loop. <coughs> um, the callback, there's another one to, to, specif to specify which callback you, oh, thanks so much. <laughs> to specify which callback um, you want called. Um, does that answer you? Uh, like if, sorry. So if I have, um, let's say I'm using the glib event loop, uh, that has a, a way to say, put a file I watch on. Uh, so, so could I say, for example, uh, have set up so that I get a callback in a glib event loop, yeah. for example, or a async IO event loop? Um, I, I think I know what you're talking about now. Um, I actually tried to do exactly the same thing with Tornado. I was trying to um, insert the same thing in the event loop, but I, I actually couldn't get it working properly. So I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer your, your question. Anyone else? Other questions? Uh, what's your experience been with using batteries? I haven't actually used them personally, but I do have quite a bit of experience with batteries since I also fly RC model planes. Um, you, you have, um, obviously you get lithium ion, which is the normal sort of laptop and cell phone batteries, but you also get lithium polymer, which is a more energy dense battery which they use in the models, for instance. 
they're a bit more volatile, so you don't want to drop them or short them or kick them around, that sort of thing. Um, but because they're light, they're, they're good for like sort of mobile projects that, that move and need to be lightweight. Um, obviously, the Raspberry Pi consumes 5 volt as an input. Um, the LiPo's generally have uh, quite a bit higher voltage. You get, I mean, 2 volts will probably be, what, 7.6 volt output, which is a bit too high for the Raspberry Pi to consume. But you get something called a, a BESC, which is a battery elimination circuit something. And that will basically regulate the, the voltage down to about 5 volts. So you can just connect any light poly battery straight through a BEC connector straight to the, to the Raspberry Pi to power it. And I've actually used a BEC, but connected to a 12 volt power supply to power the Raspberry Pi as well, which works perfectly well. So in theory, I mean, any, any battery you can connect with a BEC and it will work perfectly fine. Um, obviously, the BESC um, will have a bit of efficiency loss as it converts the, the voltage down to, to 5 volts. So um, you can accommodate for some, some loss there in efficiency, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously best be to, to match your input voltage as close as possible with the battery. Anyone else? Yes. Okay, so um, what communication do, we, do I use between my cell phone and the Raspberry Pi? Um, so like I said, I've created a REST server in Tornado, which um, basically has a simple REST API um, to query the status of my alarm system. Um, I haven't actually done a mobile app yet because my Android development is horrifically bad. Um, but the idea would be to actually then consume that. So I've got uh, port forwarding enabled on my router. Um, so I connect to a specific port on my home IP network, um, which is a dynamic DNS setup. So connect to a specific domain name uh, with that specific IP address, which forwards to the, to the actual Raspberry Pi, to the REST server sitting there. And it just basically um, does a request to that um, REST server to get the status of the alarm system. So yeah, the mobile app will actually you know, do the request itself. Yeah. <laughs> well, the alarm system itself, I mean, is also connected to mains, so um, obviously your limitation will be if your power goes down, what's going to power your alarm? But a lot of alarms these days are powered with a 12-volt lead-acid battery or whatever, um, which will keep them alive for a few hours if the power goes down. Um, my Raspberry Pi is connected straight to a power source just because I'm very hesitant to do too much integration with the alarm system in case I blow it up. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, in theory, you can actually connect your Pi to that same um, battery source, but you just have to be careful with um, the power use of your Raspberry Pi and whatever's connected to it, so that you don't drain that battery so quickly that your alarm system becomes completely useless uh, if the power goes out. Yeah. Yo. So you want to connect the GSM module to the Raspberry Pi? Um, I'm actually not sure. Um, Sorry? Sorry, I'm, I'm not so. Probably what would be easier with that is to get a cheap uh, GSM, like a 3G dongle, USB, stick it in there over your USB on your Raspberry, yeah, on your Raspberry Pi, and then just talk um, over serial ports with uh, AT commands. What do you said? <laughs> any, any other questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, so the Raspberry Pi came out of an environment of, of getting kids more into computing, right? And I, I'm really excited about it because I got into computing uh, because of simple things like this. Um, I found out that my computer could make music, right? And I, I started programming because for me it was a musical instrument. Um, a lot of the examples you've shown here are for guys about your age who have a house and care about an alarm system yeah. and keeping a garden green. Um, say, say, and that's uh, that's awesome. That's that's really cool. I'm really I'm, re I'm really inspired by hearing these things. Just all the whole your whole setup with port forwarding and stuff. I'm like, sounds fantastic. But like for a, for a child who's like, or a teenager, 14, 12, 14, what kind of projects have you seen that you thought? You know, if I was 12 or 14, this would have rocked my world. 
And what kind of budget would you need to get started with that? Like what sort of price ranges for like a, I don't know, something fun? What, what are we looking at? Uh, well, the nice thing with the Raspberry Pi is um, you, you get the exposure to the hardware side of it, which is fantastic because you have a, there's a visual element to it. I mean, to, to actually um, pro program some Python code and to switch a, a little light on, is, I mean, it's, it's kind of a magical thing because, I mean, as software developers, um, we're not used to seeing sort of hardware manifestations of our software that we write. So I think anything visual, and obviously children respond to something which, you know, as much, you know, impact as possible. So if you take that a few steps further and you, you know, create something, you know, with quite a wow factor, you know, that, that'll probably impress the kids. Um, as far as price is concerned, um, you can get these components really cheaply off um, places like Mantic or whatever. If you, if you know what you're looking for and you know where to shop, um, I mean, even eBay has completed circuits for, for next to nothing. Um, and so, so if I'd want to wow my, my nephew, about a thousand bucks would get him a bunch of hardware that he could work with. Well, that'll get you a pie and a power supply probably. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So what, no, what, no. Like what number? Um, well, I mean, uh, a hundred bucks will probably get you all the components in the world for any project that you could ever conceive of. Okay. Uh, but that's in addition to, to buying the pie and whatever else you need for the pie. So the power supply and Ooh. HDMI cables and Thanks. SD cards, etc. Another question back there? Uh, it's actually an answer, not a question. Um, on the battery thing, um, yeah. you can get all these like battery booster things for cell phones, and they actually work pretty well if you get strong enough ones. Uh, Are you talking about the, the, um, the, sorry, what do you call them? Like, um, like those monkey the things? The rechargeable, the recharging things. Yeah, you get these things for like recharging your cell phone, but it's like an extra battery that you plug in with USB. Uh, actually, I have one right here. Um, and you also get solar powered ones as well. So there's some pretty cool options if you look at that. So, so you can solar power your Raspberry Pi. Yeah. I got this one off eBay for about 100 bucks. Uh, it's got about 13,000 milliamp hours in it. Yeah, um, exactly. It actually has USB ports on it. So, I mean, I could right now probably plug my Raspberry Pi into it and it would power it quite sufficiently. Um, the earlier models of the Raspberry Pi were quite sensitive to, to uh, voltage fluctuations. Uh, and the moment you apply load to, to um, a power source, you tend to get a bit of a drop in voltage, um, and some of the earlier models were very sensitive to that. But I think with the newer, the Revision 2, I've never had any issues, and I've, I'm sure with the B+, Plus, they've actually also made some other improvements to it. So um, I don't think you'll have any issues actually powering it with a, a battery brick like that. Cool. <laughs>